session is going to be for an hour and 30 minutes. So we would like her to share with us, maybe speak for about 45 minutes. And then uh, we will take uh, different questions. Uh, one of the things I will want her to be able to do for us is that as she's sharing with us, we really want to learn from our experience. How did you start and how did you get to this place? And especially navigating the, what I would call the rough terrain of Nigeria. Uh, the ability to have done that and um, to have gotten to the pinnacle of uh, being the chairman of the foremost bank in Nigeria. Uh, the resume is very long, but I would simply like to just introduce you as the chairman of First Bank of Nigeria. And of course, the chairman of Chairs Company, uh, which you built from the scratch to uh, where it is today. Of course, there are a whole lot of other things you have achieved, but I think that these two, uh, it, it's, um, they, they are good enough. Let me let me put it like that. These two are they are good enough. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have um, Pastor Tom Fadu by my very dear sister also, who is with us, who will be the main moderator of this. After you have finished speaking, she's going to take the questions, a lot of the questions and everything uh, with you. You know the questions people are going to be sending in. And so thank you so much. And um, to have full disclosure, I I have known um, Mrs. Ibuku Awoshika for I think um, since 1980, and so that's about what 40 years now. I've known her for nearly 40 years. We were schoolmates who went to the same college, uh, the Great Ife. So I've known her for a very very long time. And not only that, we have met several times. And I followed her and uh, her success to where she had gotten to and uh, as a hardworking individual. So thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. And also she's, a minister. Uh, she's a minister also. And so we are blessed to have her uh, with us today. Thank you very much. Over to you, Tom, and my sister. Thank you very much, Pastor Gandhi. Hello, everyone. How are you? <laughs> Good I evening, ma'am. <laughs> are we? Am I? Can I go on? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Or oh, I Please, think somebody on. else wanted to say something. No, 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 no. no, no, no. I just introduced Tom. Tom will be speaking a lot anyway. So, okay. So, all right. Thank you very, very, very much for inviting me. Uh, Pastor Gandhi and I have been friends since Ife. And uh, it's great to see all the bad boys that became ministers. <laughs> They've done amazing things as ministers. <laughs> and uh, we give God glory. It just shows the power of God and what he can do in all of us. I was a Muslim when we were in Ife. So, you know, we've all come a long way uh, to yeah. get here. Um, my assignment, I believe, is very simple. And uh, I would largely share from my thoughts, my experiences um, in terms of working in the marketplace as uh, a child of God. The guideline I've been given is basically uh, wisdom in the marketplace. And the way I see it is, what is wisdom? You know, the Bible tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. But what is wisdom? Wisdom is the rightful application of knowledge, whatever knowledge that we have. But the same Bible tells us that we must seek knowledge. And in seeking knowledge, we must seek understanding. But the most important thing I would like to start with is for us not to, because we're talking about the marketplace, it's always very easy to forget about I walk with God as Christians once we get to the marketplace. So it's really critical that we stay focused on what is important. And what is important is that we are children of God. 
and we live within a kingdom that is outside of the world, even though we operate within the world. And as children of God, we are ambassadors of the kingdom, but assigned to the marketplace. I always say to people, I'm not a business person who is a Christian. I'm a Christian who is a business person. And therefore, the same way a regular pastor who preaches full-time and works full-time in church, his pulpit is his office. The place of business is my office and my place of ministration for Christ. When the Bible says that um, Christ is not going to come, until the knowledge of the word of God shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. He meant for every single one of us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And that in doing that, we will do it with a consciousness of the assignment, no matter what platform we're placed in. We're placed in different locations as a way for us to take the gospel into the nooks and crannies of the world. And for those of, those of us that are called into the business place, our pulpit is the marketplace. If you're a doctor, that consulting room where you minister your trade, that is your pulpit. If I sit in a boardroom, I have a responsibility to conduct myself, to leave in that boardroom, as a child of God, ministering Christ in everything that I do. Now, the challenge is the marketplace makes us feel that he has his own rules, makes us feel that he has the way that we should play and that we should play on his own terms. And what tends to happen is the pressure of the marketplace makes us as children of God drop our own terms and just comply with the terms of the marketplace. And in a, in a lot of cases, <clears throat> excuse me, it takes away from us the accountability that we have as children of God. So the first and the most important thing is to understand that every single one of us has been called to preach the gospel. And that at the end of our days, for all of us, what is our ultimate goal is that we will make heaven. That at the end of the day, our ultimate goal is that we will finish well. But in finishing well, we are meant to walk in the place of our own assignments. I always look at the kingdom like a jigsaw puzzle. And the jigsaw puzzle has different pieces in it. We're all one piece of the puzzle. But each piece has his own predestined assignment. And except each piece finds its rightful location, it deprives all the other pieces around it from creating the picture. And it also distorts the picture of the father. So our goal is that in living as children of God in the marketplace, that we never ever lose sight of what it is that we have been called to do. Now, what that does is it puts the responsibility on us to understand that God is on the inside of us. He will perfect all that concerns us. The Bible says that whatsoever we put our hands to do will prosper. The Bible says wherever the soles of our feet shall touch, he has given to us for a possession. The Bible has scriptures, guidelines, instructions about interaction in business with different people. It talks about a, a, a honest, um, having a honest skill. It talks to us about dealing with people with integrity and with character. It talks about keeping our word and keeping our promises. The, every guideline that we will need in order to execute our role in the marketplace, we have the word of God that can guide us on a day-to-day -day basis, much more than we actually believe. We think that the marketplace, the rules of the marketplace are the ones we must follow. There are many rules of the marketplace that they themselves submit to the word of God in the sense that 
every customer that I know wants to deal with someone that they can trust. Why? There's a reward for honesty and for being trustworthy in the business place. And what does that do for you? It means that you have integrity with the people that you do business with. What is the reward of doing that? The people you do business with once, with integrity and with character, will come back to do business with you. Why? Because they know they can trust you. They can trust your product. They can uh, trust your service. Hello. Hello? Yes. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Okay, because someone was saying hello and I wasn't sure uh, why. Because they can, they can trust you and because they can trust you, they want to be able to do business with you on a continuous basis. Any business uh, person will tell you that repeat business has a value. Why? The cost of gaining that extra business is much lower than trying to get business from a new customer. And by conducting yourself with the right value system, with the fear of God, because, you know, one of the challenges of today is that in the marketplace right now, as Christians, we have fitted in. The Bible says we're not of the world, even though we live in the world. And we're meant to stand out of the crowd based on our character, based on how we do things, based on our integrity, based on our word. You know, in the early days, a lot of business schools, the Bible was part of the textbooks for business schools. They used to teach character and integrity and you're being able to keep your word from the biblical principles. There were no need for lawyers writing contracts that were unending because you knew that if you were dealing with a man of God or a man who feared God, once you shook your hand to agree on something, it is every man will keep to their word. But we're in a different terrain right now. And that creates these challenges in the market. Now, as Christians, the way we conduct ourselves ultimately should be our advantage. And so it is wisdom for us as children of God to live even in the marketplace according to the word of God. To understand that we are ministers assigned to business. And no matter which of the platforms within business that we're in charge of or that we occupy, that within that platform, we can actually minister the word of God, not by preaching, but by our actions. Because if we conduct ourselves in a certain way, we attract people to us. And when they have troubles, because they've observed you and they have seen your ways and they have also seen the reward of your labor, and your value system, they would come to you to inquire. And when they come to you to inquire, what do we do? We tell them about Jesus. We share our gospel without ringing a bell, without going all over. There are many places that the regular pastor cannot get to. But many of us who occupy the marketplace will have a chance to walk into. Because we walk walk in there with the toga of business, but in those spaces, we get a chance to leave the word of God by our actions, by our character, and by what we do. Now, let me go to business itself, because Pastor Gandhi said to talk about what uh, my experience has been. You know, the Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, that we are the sons of God. And if we are children of God and we have wisdom, when we decide that we want to go into business, we know that God is the one that is all-knowing and all-seeing. And he knows today, he knows tomorrow. Everything can look right to us, but he knows the future that we cannot know. You and I 
I don't know what's going on behind my back, behind my head right now. I'm looking forward. If somebody is trying to knock my head behind, except there's a mirror, I cannot tell. Then it's alone talk about what is going to happen tomorrow. Today, everything can look right because I can make a judgment based on what I can see. But what I do not see is more critical. When we want to start a business, we will tend to write a business plan. But you know, one thing I know is this. The best business plan in the world is filled with a lot of assumptions. We assume this, 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 this will happen in order for the business plan to deliver the result we have written in it that it will deliver. Imagine all the plans we all had for 2020. Imagine the best business plans for businesses that will take off in January, in February, in March, in April of 2020. Well, where are they right now? Where are all those plans? Why? Because we only know as much as we can see. But as children of God in the marketplace, one critical thing is that we must accept our limitation as ourselves but to recognize the strength that we have as children of God. And that recognition makes us to lean upon God and upon his word. And therefore, no matter how smart we are, no matter how much we know, no matter how much due diligence we have done, and we must do those things, because the Bible says, show me a man that is diligent in his ways. He will stand before kings and not mere men. So there's no room for mediocrity as Christians, even in business. I cannot decide to do things anyhow and expect God to deliver a miracle for me because God will not go again his own word. A man that does not work should not eat. So if you lie on your couch waiting for miracles to happen, then you will starve to death and God will not have done any evil. You will just have uh, by your own hands brought that upon yourself. So after doing our due diligence, being thorough in business, in all that we want to do, applying all skills, all talents, gathering all information that is necessary. It still behoves on us that we spend time praying, asking the Lord for guidance. The Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. It's because A and B which option do we choose? A might look perfect. B might look like the weak option. But B might be a weak option for a few days, a few weeks, a few months. But the miracle of the season is actually in B. And that you can only get into as you spend time in the presence of God and you allow yourself to be led by the Spirit of God. And sometimes other people around you might not See what you see. Now, that does not exclude counsel because the Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. But counsel is information. The counsel that we get in making even a business decision is to allow us to have a 360 degree view of the situation so that at the end of the day, we can make an informed decision. But that informed decision should in itself be subject to the leading of the Holy Spirit so that as we're led by the Holy Spirit, as we have a witness between our thoughts and our spirit, we will know of the options that are presented to us even in business, which is the right way to go. And no matter how perfect the business plan is, every business has its seasons. I'll give you, has its seasons and it has uh, problems. I'll give you an example of a business that I've been in for 25 years and it definitely was not my idea. It wasn't something that um, I got up and thought, oh, this would be a good business to get into. I had no desire, no aspiration for it. I had no knowledge about that business in itself in any way. Um, if you come to Nigeria and you go to the banks, you would see the security doors, the bulletproof security doors at the entrance of the banks. Uh, in 1994, I think it was, I was going on a business trip to um, Italy 
and I got a message uh, from someone who said, who sent me, it was faxes then, you could get a fax, who sent a fax to say, can you look at this item? Can you check this for me in Italy and uh, see if we can source it from there? Excuse me. So I took it along. I was doing a favor for a friend and a brother. I took it along, asked my Italian business associates what, where I could find that product. They called around and identified a company in another part of the country that could offer the product. I spoke to them. They were excited because, as they said, they sell their products all around the world, but they had no market in Africa. And I was not interested because it was not something I had any interest in. I was just helping someone to get information. I explained, they asked me if I would like to come to their factory. I said no, that they should just send all the information to my London address that uh, I would pass it on to the person who needs it. They sent it everything to me. I brought it back to Nigeria. I gave it to the person for whom I was running the errand. Within that period, uh, there was a robbery in one part of Lagos. There were multiple robberies in one part of Lagos. And uh, I happened to go and visit an elderly couple that were my friends. And they were talking about this robbery. And um, I, I then said to them, well, there's this thing in my car that I feel might be able to solve the problem. The father in the house asked me to go and bring it. I brought it. He looked at it and said to his wife, how many times have I told you Nigerian banks need to start using this thing? I said to him that, but it's expensive, sir. And then he said something to me. He said, how much do they buy their cars? You know, it was like a light bulb moment. It was as if, you know, the Holy Spirit used that statement and that setup to open my eyes to, a post, to something that he wanted to bless me with, but that I seemed completely blind to. So I thought to myself, that's true. If they can buy so many cars in the banks for God knows how much, why am I saying this is expensive? It will save the lives of the customers, the staff, and preserve the money in the bank. So the thing is, my pastor always calls me Oliver Twist. The next day, I immediately, I made a call to Italy, made an appointment, went on a trip, went to that factory. Now, before then, the people I brought it back for had already decided that they were interested. I called the company to get the price for them. I passed it on. And then they decided that uh, they could not sell to the bank because uh, they don't sell to end users. And I said to them, you have a product, you have a buyer. What's your problem? He said, well, the maintenance is more important than the sale. And I said, well, they have maintenance people in the bank. Train their maintenance people. They said, no, we don't sell to end users. We only sell to our dealers in each region. And that dealer would build the team of the maintenance team that will maintain the product wherever we sell it to. Because we could sell to so many other financial institutions in your country. So... I, at this point, there was a dead, uh, a gridlock between the two. And as I had my light bulb moment, I then went ahead, went to Italy, went to this factory, visited them, uh, signed the West African dealership with them, came back to Nigeria and went to this institution that wanted to buy and said to them, okay, now you can make your order. Now, this was something that... I definitely had no plans to get into the business. Had no uh, business plan written for it at the point in time. It was just an opportunity that the Lord set me up for. And I was almost blinded to it for a while. But at the end of the day, the Lord caught, got my attention, focused on it. And it's a business that for the past 25 years, we have built in the country and beyond. So we need God in the marketplace. We need to know the word of God and we need to be committed to that word. We must understand that we are apostles in the marketplace and that the marketplace is our pulpit. 
and that in doing that business, there's certain things that as Christians are not, they're not tradable. For us as Christians, we have a code of conduct and our code of conduct will be based on the word of God. And that code of conduct, if as Christians we live by it, the integrity of every Christian in the marketplace will be without question. And what will be our integrity will be about how we do things. It will be about our moral code. It will be about the fact that we're accountable for the things that we do. It will be, it will be about the fact that our word can be trusted. It's our bond. It will be about the fact that when we make a promise to a customer, we will keep it. It will be about the fact that our products are the best in the market because we're not just trying to sell prayerfully. We're trying to sell a good product. We're trying to sell a good service. We're building the right reputation for ourselves that supports our ability to preach the gospel. Because imagine if you, someone bought something from you. There's always this scenario I always play in my head that assuming I'm selling a product and I'm not faithful in terms of pricing, that I try to take advantage of the customer in the way that I price. That when I see a rich man, my price goes up. When I see uh, a not so rich man, I will lower the price so I can make the sale. But I have no clue that they might just know each other. And it just turns out that they happen to know themselves. And one sees the other and says, oh, I like that. Oh, I bought that the other day. And said, from where? Oh, from that woman that has that store somewhere. And they, re- they both realize that they bought from the same place. And after that, the, the other person says, oh, how much did you pay for it? And it turns out that there's such a major disparity in the price, simply because I took advantage of one that doesn't have a good idea of the price and the one that knew better because he also can't afford more than that anyway. I gave closer to the right price, if not the right price. Now, just imagine that the one that I cheated in any way, that I'm the last person on the face of the earth that needs to preach the gospel to him. The question I always ask myself is that if I do, will that person accept the gospel from my lips? And if he doesn't, what have I benefited? Because then I have lost the primary purpose of my calling. We were raised as witnesses for the kingdom. That in doing what I do, that the Lord will prosper the works of my hands. I look at business as a partnership with God. I always say that the biggest partner in my business is God. And therefore, the resources that he avails to me through the prosperity of my business, that I will use the platform in itself to propagate the gospel by how I conduct myself. And I will use the resources of it, even as I am blessed by those resources. Now, if I prosper in business, obviously I will live well. I can fly first class if I want. I can fly business class if I want. Uh, if you're a woman like me and you love jewelry, I will buy the jewelry that I like. I will buy clothes that I like. I will not be shy to walk into a designer store to buy what I want because maybe I can afford it because the Lord has prospered the works of my hands. But even in doing that, I will not lose sight of the fact that I am only a treasurer for the kingdom of God and that the resources that comes through the works of my hands that the Lord the Lord prospers, that they are His and for His purpose. And as I am led, I will righteously and diligently commit those resources to the things of God as well, without allowing myself to be taken advantage of, knowing fully well that I am accountable to God for every last dime that is committed into my hand. And that the success of my business is part of propagating the gospel. Why? Because how do I lift up the name of the Lord if I fail in my business? Because I am lazy. I am not dedicated to the work as I should. I'm not careful to deliver the right service to my customer. I'm not careful to deliver the right quality product to the customer. I'm not careful 
to build the right kind of integrity that attracts customers to me consistently and allows repeat business, which allows me to prosper. All Because the marketplace generally, I mean, you can go to the market and if I use, um, there are many places you walk into and if somebody sees a chance to take advantage of you, they will. If uh, someone thinks you're not, you have little knowledge about something, they will exploit your situation and people call it being smart. But in reality, every action that we take today has a consequence tomorrow. Maybe in the life of other people, it doesn't count. But in our life as children of God, it is wisdom for us to live according to the word of God and to live with the end in sight without ever forgetting that we're not in this for ourselves. We have been called as part of the Lord's army and assigned into the marketplace, whether as a business person, whether as a professional, whether to serve on a board one way or the other, and that God rewards our faithfulness in doing those things. Okay, I'm chairman of First Bank. All glory to God. But, like my pastor told me when I was appointed, what most people did not know is that for many, I've been in business for 31 years. I have spent 31 years building the chair center group, multiple companies within a manufacturing group, including a company in Italy that manufactures those security doors that I told you about. Because the original people that were producing for me for 20 years went bankrupt. And when they did, the Lord gave me the grace and facilitated the opportunity for me to buy the rights to the designs and the production, the production right, and to take from their staff that were being let off as they went bankrupt to set up a factory right in the same town where they operated and they produced for my Nigerian market and for other markets uh, uh, around the world. And part of why that was important to me is because I had products that sold to customers with a promise to continue to deliver the spare parts for those systems to work. Every single one of those units has a minimum of 10 years lifespan. I have commitments to continue to guarantee that they will have the spare parts for it to run, that I can maintain and keep them working. When that factory was going to go down, what was uppermost on my mind, apart from being able to continue in that business line, was to also keep my word to customers that I had made a sale to and who trusted me by buying those systems from me and expected that they will not be left with a worthless uh, piece of uh, equipment that they would not be able to use and they would, it would result in massive loss of assets and money for the institutions. That drove me to immediately think of how to be able to solve the problem. And then God kicked in a solution by supporting what I needed to do and allowing me to come to pass that we're able to set up that factory. I remember in 2004, just over the news, the government announced a complete ban of everything related to furniture. As at that point in time, I had been in business for 15 years and I had built a successful furniture manufacturing business. But at a stage over those years, we are transited from just local manufacturing to producing from five countries, using OEM manufacturers to produce our CKD parts for us. And we brought the components back into Nigeria and combined them in different collections, depending on the designs we were trying to execute for different customers. And it was a major part of how our business grew aggressively. Now, all of a sudden, there was a change of regulation. Now, that change of regulation could have shut down my business completely overnight. I had two options. Either to shut down or two, to become a smuggler. Now, one of the things we do well is that we allow the market to define what we do or how we react. There's a particular word which I wrote down that. I would like to use when we allow situational wisdom, you know, 
to take over what we do in a particular place. When there's a conflict between our moral conviction, what the word says to us, and what the circumstance says to us, and how the circumstance determines what we do, rather than the word or our moral code that we hold ourselves up to. At that point, it was either become a smuggler and easy to justify, oh, I've invested so much in the business. I've been in this business for 15 years. I know that God will understand. I don't have any choice because, you know, this is what government has done. And I have all these people that work for me. I have all these. I, alongside my business growing, I'd also built a ministry, Christian Missionary Fund, where that we support Christian missionaries working across the length and breadth of Nigeria. And I've been doing that now for about 25 years. As at that point, I'd been doing it for a year, maybe close about 10 or 11 years as at that point. So I had many reasons to give myself an excuse to con- to start, to continue the business through an unrighteous act. And after a while, you will see your conscience and then you will forget. But I looked at the scenario. I was convicted by the word of God that I knew and I couldn't drop. And my understanding of the God that I had called my God. The Bible says that they that know they are God, they shall be strong and they will do exploits. That knowing and understanding of God is what keeps you straight, what keeps you standing, what helps you to defy the odds, what makes you able to look the trouble in the eye and say, no, I'm not going down a route that I know God is not there. I looked at my situation And as everybody pitied me and was worried about what I was going to do, I went back to my safe place. And I knew my safe place was God. And I went back to God and I said to him, I know you, Lord. You're not a wicked God. You're not a God that will establish establish my feet upon the rock and kick the rock from under my feet. That's not who you are. And And I know without a doubt that you have called me into this business. That this is the place of my assignment. And whatever this situation is, I know you're on top of it. And the Bible tells me that all things work together for my good. Which means that there's good for me in this situation. And you will work that good out. So Lord, keep me calm. Guide me. Lead me in the way to go. Show me how to continue in this business without betraying you. I cannot take from you in the time of good and abandon you in the time of challenge. Like the three Hebrew children, like they said, our God will deliver us. And even if he did not deliver them, they were certain that they will not bow to the the Nebuchadnezzar's uh, thing that he had built. And obviously God showed up for them. And as God showed up for those three Hebrew children, he showed up for me because as I prayed and asked the Lord for guidance, within days, I, I had a, a clear idea because some time before then, I remember that the Lord had asked me, what if the government of your country had a change of regulation for just like a random thought in my mind one day, but apparently it was God. And I put together a plan of action in case it happened, that what I would do. So when this happened, Within 48 hours, I had moved. The next day after the announcement, I went to all my key clients that I was working on major projects for them at that point and said, look, this is what has happened. This is what the government has announced. We have 90 days window before this comes into effect. If you pay me this and you pay me this, I promise all your projects that I'm working on, I will meet my obligation and we will deliver. And I told all my staff, don't worry, I'm not firing anybody. Just pray for me that the Lord will grant me the grace and the wisdom for this season and this time so that we can get over this. If I didn't run into God to seek the wisdom, I will never know that there were better solutions for me than if I'd gone to become a smuggler, which at the end of the day would have cut me off from the grace of God. Well, that whole process led to my joint venture partnership with the largest French manufacturer of office seating. When, the first time I went there to discuss about this, they laughed. They'd been producing for us for about 10 years. When I went to say, well, you're not going to be able to produce for me for Nigerian market anymore. You have to come in and let's produce together in Nigeria. They laughed. 
but they didn't know what I knew. And what I knew is that all things are possible with God. They're one of the top 10 in the world. They're the largest in France. They don't produce anywhere outside of Europe. Was Nigeria going to be their first place to go? But they did, eventually. Within a few months, they had agreed to a joint venture partnership. The first thought they were doing about 5%. At the end of the day, they went up to 21%. As they did, Guarantee Trust agreed that they were going to invest on the SMEIS uh, program that was on then, and they bought 32% of the project. Two uh, individuals who were friends of mine invested 5% each, and I raised the money for the remaining 37%. And within 10 and a half months, we had opened a, a factory in Nigeria, trained Nigerians that had never been anywhere outside of Nigeria in France for months as the core team to start the production of the first set of international offices in sub-Saharan Africa from Nigeria. It came out of my crisis. But more importantly, it came out of running into the hands of God and not away from him. It came out of pursuing his righteousness as, of, as pursuing my easy option. Now, one key thing is, when we're living our lives, the whole world is watching. Everybody is waiting to see what we will do. Shebi, they say they are Christians. Okay, now we'll see what she will do here. She confesses that you should do business by the word of God. As at that point, for about seven years up to that point, I was running a program on TV, about seven stations in Nigeria on behalf of Fountain of Life Church, teaching businesses way, how to do business according to the word of God. Now, before the whole world, I had a crisis that was the test of every word I'd ever preached. I had to leave by the word of God. And out of that crisis came the Sokwa Church Center factory. Once we got that running, I went ahead to set up FMM, Furniture Manufacturers Mad, another factory processing a laminate uh, components, both for us and for other manufacturers in the country. But people were watching. People, there was a lot of media report, there was a lot of stuff. We then became the resource, the supplier to a lot of our competition in the market. Because the problem was common to all, but we had created the solution because we were not willing to do the alternative. And therefore, a lot of our competitors became our dealers, selling for us. So we could get into areas of the market that we otherwise did not control. And that allowed our business to grow. Obviously, an offshoot of that is that a lot of other people were watching and observing your value system, your response to crisis, your, your response, your character, your integrity in the middle of a hard situation and all of that. And in the middle of all of that, God decided to honor and to reward me even further. As I started receiving invitations from the left, from the right, to serve on different boards. And I have between, and as you got there and they found that the substance of who you are, you know, you add value to offer because that's another thing. When you get to the table, you must show up. As a child of God, the spirit of excellence must manifest in everything that you do. You must show the glory of your father by being diligent, by doing what you need to, by being the best in the business that you do, by being the best in your industry, by showing yourself approved, by studying. I went, I'd gone back to school in the middle of all of, in fact, I was in business school when all this crisis I was talking about happened. Finished that executive MBA. I've gone back to school. I go back to school every year. Study one thing or the other, always updating myself, putting knowledge on my fingertips so I can respond. And added to that is righteously guarding one's integrity and character and preserving the testimony that we all owe to God as children of God. That when people look at us and see the way we do things, they must see Christ in us so that they're drawn to the gospel because of the way that we do uh, what we do. There's so much to talk about in terms of how we operate in the marketplace. But what is key is that we must understand that our primary assignment is as children of God. 
we are assigned to the marketplace that the marketplace is our pulpit. And if a pastor who preaches on a pulpit gets into adultery, gets into fornication, gets into alcoholism, gets into all sorts of things, we will all judge him. But the word of God and the laws of God are not just for the pastor and the pulpit, for every single child of God. And our pulpit is in the marketplace. And how we do what we do there must showcase the glory of our Father and draw people to the kingdom so that they would want to come to Christ and to accept Christ into their lives. And that is our responsibility on a day-by-day basis. The market will try us, will be challenged by different things that are thrown at us. And there are times that we will fail. But we know that God is on our side and every time we fall, the Lord will lift us up once our heart is sincere and we can lean on him and draw on the strength um, of God to be able to stand, to be accountable, to be transparent, to stand with integrity, to stand with character, and to have the voice to preach the God the gospel without shame. Thank you. I can see that you're already up and ready. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ma. <clears throat> that was so, so enlightening. Um, you have such a powerful and encouraging testimony. And um, basically, <clears throat> you know, you know, I don't think I ever really saw it that way, that the markets, you know, relating the market as a pulpit and comparing it to a pastor on a pulpit. A pastor who is ministering on a pulpit is not expected to go into sin to compromise and all that. So it is exactly the same thing for us that if we see the marketplace as our pulpit, we ought to walk in truth, in integrity, and in righteousness. So um, I have a question for you here. You know, you had also said that you are first a Christian and then a business person. So yeah. if you were to arrange, so that you are also a lot of a, many other things, like you are a wife, you are a mother. And you're also a minister of God. So if you were to arrange yes. it in order, how would you go? You've arranged two, Christian okay. and business person. How about the rest? Wife, mother, and well, ordained minister. Okay. The first on my list is my relationship with God. And that's at the top of everything. That's where my life, that's the center of my life. It's the core of my life. And that relationship controls everything else. Everything else in my life is subject to that. Okay. Now, when I say my relationship with God, I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about my one-on-one relationship with God. Okay. Now, after that is my family. That's my family, my husband, my children. They come after that. And after my relationship with God comes my business, my career, and all of that. Now, don't forget that in my relationship with God is my service to God. It depends on your understanding of it. My service to God is either in the church or outside of the church. Now, I'm here on this platform today with you. This isn't my church, but... I, I worship at the Fountain of Life Church, Pastor Taiwo Dukoya. You had Pastor Domti just before me. Those are my pastors. That's my church. Mm-hmm. For many years, I was head of business fellowship in our church from the early days of the church till just a few years ago. So, and I'm a serving pastor at the Fountain of Life Church. But even as that is a platform that is key in my life and the, my house of submission, I am completely, I have complete understanding of the calling of God on my life and it goes beyond church because I speak in different platforms, both secular and uh, spiritual. But at the center of everything that I do, the righteousness of God drives it. 
even if I'm going to speak to kings, I will still pray and ask the Lord to fill my mouth with the right word. Why? Because I know that no matter what I'm doing, I'm in the service of God. And my husband and my children, if something to do with them is key and important on a day, church would wait. Business will wait. I will. And on the day that business is really important, based on how I have gained equity with my husband and my children, I would have the release to do what I need to do in my business or in my corporate work because I'm not a schizo. I only have one life and all the different components of my life consist in the one me in submission to my God and a clear understanding of what my assignment is guides the decisions that I make on a day by day basis. And wisdom tells me that I need a home that works, a relationship with my husband that grants me the support and the environment for me to operate. It's almost impossible for me to be me, except that I married the right man and I have his support and his encouragement and a man who is comfortable and confident to allow me the expression of myself and who understands that in doing the things I do, I am serving God. And who knows that that is important to me? And in raising my children, I have raised them as well to have an understanding of the things that are important in my life. So we're not, see, all of these things are not separate. But at the end of the day, the one thing we must never lose sight of is the call of God on your life is your responsibility. And the only one that is accountable for it is you. Your husband will not be an excuse for failure nor will your children, nor will your career or church. You must work out your salvation and see how all of it work together for you to deliver on the assignment that God has given to you. My biggest ambition in life is to die empty. Nothing, I do not want any gift of God or talent that I have or ability that I have that has not been deployed in the interest of the service of God. Because none of it is required in heaven. And I want to go with zero content. That is what drives me. But all of it with wisdom to balance. And knowing fully well, I need this vehicle to work well. So I must also rest my body. And so my holidays are secured. I take two, three holidays a year, as busy as my life is. And when my children need me, they become the most important thing. When my business really needs me, it becomes the most important thing. Even in the midst of that as well, you don't allow the arrogance of thinking that nothing can work without you. So I love to delegate. I do not do anything that anybody else can do. It doesn't make any sense. If you can do something better than me, then it's yours to do. It's not mine to do. I do the things I'm best at. So I play to my strength and I allow other, I accept support and everything that allows me to fully deploy what I would like to do. I hope that helps your question. Yes, thank you very much, ma'am. I just want to ask a follow-up question regarding that. You spoke about your husband being very supportive and how you wouldn't even be able to do all that you're doing if you did not have a supportive husband. Um, Now, there are a lot of women that aspire. They are strong women. They want to do a lot. Like you had also mentioned that you, you, you want to die empty. So, but I've heard a lot of women also complain that maybe they do not have the support of their husbands, but it may not be necessarily their husband's fault. It may be that they don't know how to navigate it. And maybe it is also their husband's fault in some situations. So this question is, what words would you have for a woman who you can consider a strong, aspiring woman? And what words would you have for the husband of such a woman? So we want you to address the woman, and we also want you to address the man. All right. I'd like to split it into maybe two or three parts. Yes, ma'am. The first part is, before we get to the point where the woman finds herself in the middle of a, a marriage with an unsupportive husband, We need to understand that every child of God is on assignment for God. 
and we must help them to be in a situation where they're able to deliver. And one of the things we must do, especially where women are concerned, is we must train women about how to pick their husband. And I say this with all seriousness. You know, we don't, we don't, we just want every girl to bring a, a husband home. We do not give room for the thoroughness that is required when we understand the critical role that husbands play in the life of a woman. Our husbands are key success factors in our lives when, for a woman. It is therefore important that we teach our daughters. I don't have the privilege of having women. I have three sons, but I have many daughters. That we teach our daughters to first have a sense of themselves, have a sense of who they are, have a sense of who they have been called to be, have a sense of their own worth and the value that God has placed in them, have a sense of the fact that they're going to have to account for their lives to God and they have to make sure that everything works together for them to be able to account right. And with that sense, when they start having suitors or boyfriends or people that want to go out with them or want to marry them, their considerations cannot be mundane. It cannot be about his handsome, his father is rich. What do you have to do with that one? The handsome guy, if you feed him well tomorrow, he'll get fat and he can look different. Who knows? His father is rich. Well, people change status every day. And if you are a hardworking young woman, make your own money and spend it. So that's one factor. We have to teach our daughters to have the right kind of considerations. You want to marry a man that fears the Lord? A man who has an understanding of the fact that you're a child of God as he is, that there's a, pop, there's, there's a purpose for which God created you and has called you, and that he, as the head of that home, is a nurturer that he has an assignment to nurture you for God in order to be everything that God has called you to, and he will be rewarded for it as well. And that if the Bible says your wife is your helper, that a wise man will know that the wife that he marries is meant to add to him, not take, take away from him. And that the way she will best add to him is that he adds to her so that she can become everything that she has been called to be. My name is Ibuku Aoshika, but is Aoshika my father's name? It's not. My father's name is Adekola, but the name that you know and that the whole world knows as I have emerged since I got married 30 years ago is Aoshika. So in my own little way, I have brought value and honor to the Awushika name by doing the things that God has allowed me to do. But also thank God that I've been able to do it with the support of a wise husband who understands that in allowing me to be myself, in allowing me to emerge. I mean, when my husband and I met and agreed to marry, all he knew was he married an ambitious young woman who was trying to build a furniture manufacturing company. There is no way he could have sat down 30 years ago and imagined that I am who I am today. But he married for he married a woman that he cared about and a woman that he had he had the courage and the confidence to support and to nurture. And at every stage as I emerged, my husband emerged with greater capacity to support me for where I emerged to. And the honor is his as well. As the honor comes to our family. And we're stronger together because our combined resources makes us a stronger team than our individual self. So first, we must teach our girls to marry for the right reasons and to patiently wait to find the man that can, has the capacity for who they know they are or for where they know that they are going. And the man 
who does not nurture his wife to be the best of herself is a fool. Because it would mean that, uh, the Bible says he who finds a wife does what? Finds a good thing thing. and obtains favor from the Lord. So if you get a good thing and you treat it like, and you turn it into a bad thing, it's your loss. You are the one that's destroyed an asset that is meant to complete you and help you to reach farther than you are able to reach on your own. And we need to teach the men. We need to teach our women. And women must If you're already in it, if you've already married and you're in in that situation, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. There's a wisdom for every situation. And that wisdom requires that we look at our own specific situation. We look at the kind of man that we have married. And we, by the helping of the Holy Spirit, we find the language and the communication tool that allows us to endear ourselves to him in a way that we can draw him to the place where we can get his support. It's not, I don't think any situation is hopeless. I think there's a wisdom that solves every problem. We just must find it. We must find the right language. We must find the right voice. We must find the right situation. We must find the right support system. And not look outside at how other people do it. One woman Mm -hmm. tells you, I cannot kneel down for my husband. (laughs) That's her. Mm. If that's what will solve your own problem, Mm. well, after you finish kneeling down, you go outside. Is there a mark on your head that says this is what you've done? (laughs) But you get to do what you want to do and you fulfill the purpose of God on your life. The Bible says you should work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation and achieve the goal and have the results that you need. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, my next question here is related to the very powerful testimony you shared regarding uh, the obstacle that came up in your business when um, Nigeria um, raised a, a major ban and it affected your business so much. Um, so the, the question is, how do you as a business person know when to stop a business? Because you also spoke of the fact that there will be times when there will be failure and all that. So when do you know when an obstacle should lead to you just closing that business and moving on to other things? And when do you know when that obstacle is such that you're supposed, that's supposed to be a stepping stone onto greater heights, like it was in your own case? Okay. See, there are two key things in business. We have the spiritual, but we also have the physical. And the physical part is the knowledge part. If you're running a business and you have a scenario and things are not working, what should you do? You should be diligent to evaluate the true situation of your business. To identify what the challenges are and to be true to yourself. When you find out what the challenges are, to find what your mitigants are too. What are the solutions you must apply to solve the problem? Is it a market situation? Because, you know, sometimes we just because we started a business does not mean that we have done the right thing. Because sometimes, you know, the Bible says that we receive prophecies and all of that in part. And sometimes we receive one part and we run off without getting the other part. And a good idea, might we might execute it in the wrong time and in the wrong season. Or we might execute it in the wrong location. That has nothing to do with God. That has to do with us making the right decisions for the business. Because if I sell a retail product, okay, let me use... You're you're Nigerian, so you understand the Nigerian scenario. If you see people selling pure water in traffic in Lagos, and they're making a lot of money because they're going through so many bags in a day, and because of that, you decide that, ah, I'm going to start selling pure water. I live in Abelkuta. I'm going to start selling pure water as well. 
If they're making money from it in Lagos, there are people in Nabe Okuta who can make money from it. What is the fundamental difference between pure water in Lagos and pure water in Nabe Okuta? What makes the pure water in Lagos a viable business? Traffic. It is the fact that people sit in traffic for hours on end. They become thirsty. There's still many hours from getting home and they need, they can't get out of the vehicle to go and look for something. So they're ready to do all their shopping in traffic. That's what makes pure water or all the products that are sold on the road in Lagos a good business for those that do it. If the same circumstance does not exist in Abel Okuta, then you don't have the same scenario for the success of the business. It means that you might be able to sell some pure water in Abel Okuta, but you don't have the volume because on every bag of pure water, the margin is very small. And if you're selling products that have low margin, what do you need? You need high volume. Because it's by selling large volume multiplied by the small margin that allows you to make good profit for your business in one, in a day. But if you are able to sell, but you don't sell enough volume and the margin, the expected margin is still the same or even less. Why is it less? The buying power of people in Abel Kuta is probably lower than the people in Lagos. I'm just making these assumptions. Uh, but those are business facts that we, in being diligent, the Bible says, show me a man that is diligent in his ways. In our diligence in our business, we would have done our research. We would have collected all the necessary data. We would have evaluated whatever data is relevant to the business that we want to do before we even decide to do that business at all. Now, there's another thing. The Bible says do not despise the days of humble beginnings. A lot of people actually don't believe that when it comes to business. If they have the opportunity to get a lot of money, they will set up big on day one because they think that when they have the opening of the business, that's how they impress their friends and they impress people. And then if they're Christians too, they can give a big testimony about this big God and this big thing. It's got nothing to do with it. When the Bible says, do not despise the days of humble beginnings, it's because every business idea that you have, when you put it into a business plan, you have made a lot of assumptions that tells you at the end of the day, in your conclusion in that business plan, that that business idea will be successful. Until you get into execution, before you sometimes realize that some of those assumptions are not as true as you think, or that they're not true to the level that you think they will be true for you to have the level of success that you see. But if you if you start small and you meet, um, you get into situations that uh, make some of your assumptions not to be true, you can make adjustments, you can make changes, but at the lowest cost. Why? Because it's small. Every time you have a business idea and you put a plan together, you should have what is called your proof of concept. What is proof of concept? Testing that that idea works as you have said that it will work. When you have the proof of concept, the things you discover not to be, you adjust them and then you try again. And then when you find that it works, you test it in the market, you get some response, and you also get some resources that you can add to the business to scale up at a stage. And when you grow, every time a business grows, there are new sets of challenges. There are new issues that come up. There are new factors to deal with. And when you do it in stages, you're able to adjust to those situations in order for the business to continue to grow and to grow well. So it's not just because I'm a Christian and I'm in business, does not mean that I will just be successful. I have to work at it. I have to do all the right things. I have to gain knowledge. I must seek knowledge. I must go to business school if I need the knowledge. I must go read books if I need to. There's nothing that says I cannot go and 
serve in tutelage with somebody who already knows the industry or find a mentor that will guide me and all of that. And if I haven't done all, the Bible says stand and see the salvation of God. If I do everything that I need to do in a particular business and I can see realistically that the market or the situation is not responding as I expect that it should. And I have prayed and I have fasted and I cannot see the way out. It is humility to sometimes accept that I made a mistake in terms of my assumptions, but I I have not made a loss in terms of my experience. Because some of the knowledge that I will gain from that process might be the core knowledge that will help me to do the next thing that is actually the place that I'm going to. Sometimes we have stop gaps in our journey of life. The Bible says in the world we will see troubles. God did not promise that we will live lives without troubles. Mm -hmm. He didn't say that because I'm a Christian and I'm in business, I'll never have challenging times. Mm -hmm. How many times will the righteous fall? 70 times, Mm -hmm. seven times. So the Bible has prepared us for a lot of things that we then come back to blame God for. God, the only thing is God has said that if we go through the waters, it will not drown us. If we go through the fire, it will not consume us. When we go through the wilderness, the Lord will preserve us. So he has given us an assurance of survival in every situation that we find ourselves because we will lean on our God. And, and that's why they that know their God will be strong in the time of the troubles and they will see exploits because as they stand with God, follow his guidance and his leading, take the right decisions. And, you know, even when we think we have heard God, sometimes we're assuming that we have. You know, it, the way sometimes the voice is so gentle, you're not even sure. But you act in faith on what you think you have heard. And sometimes it will pan out and I always get excited. Every time I feel as I sense something the Lord wants me to do and I test it out and it works, it's always a beautiful day for me because it just makes me so excited that, God, I heard you very clearly. And when it doesn't quite work out and I try it, I throw everything at it and it doesn't, I'm like, okay, Lord, you know, I thought this is what you're saying, but I thank you anyway. Help me to take the learnings from here and help me to move forward so I can go. We, we will never be alone. So there's no situation, even in our business, that will leave us hanging. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. So somebody um, put a question on Facebook and asked if you have ever failed. (laughs) Because, I mean, we always hear a lot of successful people say that, oh, they failed 10 times, they failed 20 times. You know, some inventors, we hear, oh, they tried this thing, they failed a thousand times, you know. So have you ever failed? In 31 years of building a business, <laughs> is it absolutely possible that there's no time that things would have gone wrong? But you know, my personal policy for life is I'm not a believer in failure. Why? Because I believe that our life is a total spectrum. It starts the day we're born. It ends the day we die. Our lives are in seasons. Different stages within that are total life, we will have different seasons. Some will be great, some will be challenging, but none of it can determine how we will finish until the end. Some are slow starters, some are late starters. And the only time you will know if you have failed is if you die without fulfilling the purpose of God for your life. Because some of the seasons that people say is a season of failure in your life is your biggest preparation for the biggest opportunities of your life that are ahead of you. Do you want to imagine what my mindset was like in that 2004 when, in fact, I was in business school. I was home. I'd come home and I was doing some work. and 
someone close to me called to say, did you listen to the network news? And I said, no. And said, oh, government just made this announcement. So I went to my husband and said, this is what uh, Tyre said. And we listened to the news cap. At the end of it, they reel every, the main highlights again. And we heard the announcement. Obviously, that's a traumatic thing at that moment. But it's not the things that don't work. It's how you react to it. It's about the cup that is half full or half empty. Do the troubles or the things that men call failure in your life, do they shut you down because you do not understand that when you're going through the fire, God says he will be there to preserve you. That when you walk through the waters, that it will not drown you. Do you not understand that the God that you know is more than able to deliver you in that situation? And therefore you draw strength from that and lean on that God to walk you through out of that situation. So, you know, it's not whether you failed at 20 or you failed at 30. Do you die a failure? Why? Because you choose to give up before you go to your breakthrough. You live in America. KFC, at what age did Colonel Sanders discover, did his recipe become a commercial venture? After retirement, at the age of 65, wow. he had retired. His pension was not enough for him and his wife. And he knows that he had this recipe that every time he made chicken, all his family and neighbors loved it, and people always wanted more. He then decided to take value from something that other people have already appreciated. That's the story. Colonel Sanders is what? Long dead. But KFC remains as what? As a global multinational food chain in every part of the world. His story, his legacy is safe and secured. Even though he himself only had how many years within it. So the time and the season for each person is different. And don't measure whether you have succeeded or failed by other people. The agenda of God for each person is different. And we must learn to work with God as individuals. We must understand that God has a plan for my life. And I know that he's not finished with me. And no matter what I'm going through, I know that he will take me to the place that he has assigned me to. And he will help me to fulfill the assignment for which I was born. That is my attitude. It's how I walk through my challenging moments. It's how I look at the troubles of my life when I walk into that season. It's what makes me get up and fight. Because first, I know that I'm not alone. I know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I know that God delights in the prosperity of his people. And I'm his daughter. He delights in my prosperity. I know the Bible says that wherever the soles of my feet shall touch, the Lord has given to me for my possession. So I know that whatever I put my hands to do, I will prosper at it. I might not be prospering at it right now. But the word of God is a fact. And I know that in the season that that word of God is not manifesting, what I need, the manure I need to fertilizer, I need to feed it with is the word of God and me standing in faith, challenging God that says that I should come and let us contend, contend together over his word. I know that God is true to his word and therefore I'm never afraid to challenge God concerning his word. I fight a good fight of faith and that's what we need to do. We will have troubles. That's, don't allow anybody to intimidate you with uh, trouble you failed. Look, it's a transit point. You should never get stuck in your transit location. Never lose sight of the end game. We will all finish well. And finishing well is not me finishing like you or finishing like Pastor Gandhi. It's me finishing as everything that God has called me to do. Finishing as me and you finishing as you. And that is different for each and every one of us. And that's what we must never lose sight of. Thank you very much, Ralph.
So there's this question. Um, <clears throat> actually, <clears throat> excuse me. I have three boys just like you. <laughs> and oh, a few years ago, <laughs> yes, ma'am. A few years ago, uh, I attended the graduation for my son, my last son. He was graduating from elementary school to middle school. Okay. And I observed that all, at least, at, I mean, I could say 99%, but let me just be a little conservative. 95% of the gifts of the best students, academic, I, I mean, the academic gifts went to girls. So I was wondering, I mean, when I was going back home, in the car, I asked my son, I said, why is it that all the girls took the kids? He told me that, oh, because the girls are, they don't have any other thing to do apart from studying, but the boys are busy, you know, they have so many things to do. <laughs> that was very funny to me, but the question really is, how come at that level, it means that those girls are really smart, but maybe add 30 years down the line, like in the boardroom where you are chairman of First Bank and where you are chairman of many boards, I'm sure that you don't see 90, 90, 95% women there. It's now, the reverse is now the case. So why, I mean, I guess we most, most of us would know why that happens. But I mean, is that something we should be satisfied with and let it remain so? Because maybe women have the excuse of having babies and all that. Or, I mean, is that how God meant it to be? If not, what can well, we as, far as, as women do to change that equation? I mean, to, to, to make sure that th those brains don't stop working after we graduate from college, but they keep on working to get us to the boards, to be chairman of boards and all that. Okay, the first thing I'd like to take on is whether that's how God made it to be. I've never read the Bible. I've never read it anywhere in the Bible where any promise is tied only to the male gender. Every promise of God in the Bible is for male, is for the children of God. And I'm a child of God as you are. And every female child of God is a child of God. So every promise of God in the Bible, every word of declaration, every word of blessing is meant for every child of God, male and female. Every blessing of God is meant for every child of God, male and female. Now, society, and if we're even following the example of the Bible, you would see that even in the Old Testament, there were judges that were women. There were rulers that were women. There were women that led Israel to war. Mm -hmm. So those you know, culture of different parts of the world as Christianity journeyed across the world has been mixed up with the faith. And human beings are expressing their own ideas as God's idea. Because there's no way, nowhere in the Bible, that every gift in my life and in the life of all the women I know, who are my friends who are doing great things, are gifts of God in their lives. And all of them that I know are mothers, their wives, and they're successful at what they do as well. Now, there is a systemic problem that makes that happen. And the girls compete effectively with the boys until they even start their working career, the early stages of their career, up till about middle management. It's generally from about middle management that the separation begins to happen. And a lot of that comes from some of the things we do in the society. From maybe some parents that uh, lack knowledge and have told their children, their female children over time about their limitations. I think one of the things my father forgot to do was to tell us, and we're mainly girls in my house, he forgot to tell us that we were girls and there were certain things we were not supposed to do because he didn't believe in that. Mm -hmm. And so we grew up with the confidence that we could do whatever we wanted to do with our lives and do it well. And every father owes it to their daughters to tell her that she can be anything that she wants to be in this life. 
even as you must tell your sons to. The other major factor is if we don't train our boys to understand that their wives are assets to them, I have seen many smart, ambitious women get derailed once they get married and once they start having children simply because the home environment does not facilitate their progress. And the larger society then tells them that they are the ones that should make the sacrifice of their career, their ambition, their vision of sacrificing their talent in order for their home to work. There's nothing that says that it cannot work for both if we understand that we're working as a team. And if we create systems that makes... If we raise boys with better understanding, if we build societies that better supports the woman in her role, if uh, corporate organizations create a more supportive environment, I think some things have changed forever right now because of COVID-19. Because for the last five months, most of the world has been locked down. And a lot of things that people thought could not be, uh, be done from home has been done from home. So when women were agitating for quite a while about the fact that the fact that you're pregnant and you've gone off to have a child should not be a disadvantage in a workplace. You shouldn't be penalized for the time that you have, that you are, you have maternity leave because you can work. You might not be able to work in the office, but you can work from home. Because the moment the baby is sleeping, you can do some work, you can still finish projects, you can do stuff if that's what you want. Because at the other end is what do the women want? Because every woman doesn't want the same thing. So we shouldn't have this general rule. Because we're also all called to different things. It's about what you know that God has called you to. What are you accountable to God for? What are the talents that you have? that will build the kingdom, that will build the country, that will build the nations, that would help to propagate the gospel. Every child of God that does well is an ambassador of Christ, that does well righteously, whether male or female. So we have a responsibility, and the church is key to this. This is the reality. Why? The unit of the family, especially for a Christian family, is embedded in one church or the other. The narrative of the church affects how that family functions. And we need to revisit how we look at these things or how we educate these matters in a way that we help our daughters to be the value creator that God has made them to. Because every single one of us will account to God for the gifts of God in our life. And that gift is without um, any resort to whether you're male or you're female. Well, if I never went to school or if my father didn't give me me the opportunity to express myself in business because he was not confined to, oh, you have to go and get a job, you have to go and get a job. And that would would have turned out not to have been my natural line. I would not have been able to have built a successful business school for 31 years by revealing the skills and the talents I have through that business. I would not have been in a situation where I'm then invited to serve on different boards, which will culminate, uh, culminate in something like me becoming the chair of the 125 year old financial institution as the first uh, female, which is an honor and a privilege, and I do it flying the flag of righteousness and the banner of Christ. So it's, it's, we do God a disservice. If we create a system that does not allow, look, look at Nigeria, for instance, and largely look at the world population. If I use Nigeria as an example, population of men and women is about 50-50. If we don't want the women to maximize themselves, we will kill the men. 
Because 50% of the men will have to overwork <laughs> themselves to provide for 100% of the population. Yeah. But if you want Nigeria to prosper and to do well, we need all hands on, te- on, on deck, all talents deployed, every mind used, every gift of God given for the development of this country applied. There are servants of God in church that add value, that are female. Preaching a sermon is not about being male or female. It's about if the Spirit of God will speak through you to deliver the assignment. So there's a lot that we need to educate within the matter of male and female, and we have to start from our children. And as we build forward, and in my opinion, the church has a major role. And I'm praying that our churches will find the courage to rethink how this is communicated. I'm lucky to have a pastor who is the firm believer in the gifts of women and a natural uh, encourager of women in many ways. But how has that affected our righteousness? Not negatively. So be the best of yourself or be the best child of God that you can be. And in doing that, you actually can be the best wife and the best mother. You need the wisdom of God to bring it all together and to Mm -hmm. succeed doing that. And if God has called you to all of those three offices, the office of you, the office of the wife, the office of the mother, and he wants you to succeed in all three and he sure does, then the grace to do it he has already given you. The wisdom for it is is in the word of God. The order of every house is settled. It doesn't matter whether I'm chairman of the world. My husband is the head of our house. And that's not in question because every ship has a captain. So that's not it. But we're, we're partners in the journey of our life. But there's one person that captains. We think together. We plan together. Let's be honest. If you have a wife like me, would you think that she has nothing she can say to add value to a decision-making process? <laughs> Yeah, you, it would be a foolish thing to do. So really, it's about us working together, thinking together. And I would be foolish to think that, oh, I know so much. Without listening to counsel and advice from my husband and combining that with whatever it is that I know in order to make the right decision. Because the Bible already says in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. So if we follow the order God has said, it will work for all of us. The home will work. The businesses will work. All the women will be allowed to express themselves and the value will be gained by the institutions, the nations and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, there's one more question that was sent via the email. I, but our time is up. I want to ask Pastor Fadel, our chairman, if I should go ahead with that question or not. <laughs> okay, well, since I didn't hear from him, I think we're good. I'm not going to take that question. Because our time is, yeah. Oh, okay. I just got a message that I could go ahead and take it. Okay. So the question is, yeah, you kind of touched on it about you and your husband planning together, taking decisions together, and he is the head of the household. So this question says that what, that can you define what submission means? Because in some cultures, submission means subjugation and and that is how it is expressed from the husband to the wife. So what is your own definition of submission as a wife? Your practical definition should of I submission. Have, what does that mean? Should I have any definition of submission outside of what the Bible says that it is? And what does the Bible say that it is? The Bible does not say that women should submit to men. It says that I should submit to my own husband. The husband that I have become one with. And that husband of mine has also been mandated to love me as Christ loves the church. When you love a woman the way Christ loves the church, you will love her unconditionally. You love her with her strengths. You love her with her weaknesses. You love her on her best day. You love her on her worst day. 
Because Christ died for an imperfect church before that church even repented and came to him. So it's really about having an understanding of the purpose of God for um, that uh, message of um, submission and understanding that, as I'd said earlier, I personally understand that my husband is the head of our home and we would work together to agree how we move our family forward always. But if we get to a place where there is one decision has to be made, even if I disagree, I will accept his position. But, and this is my but, every person has a boss. Who is my husband's boss? God. Because the Bible says, I should submit to my husband as unto the Lord. So my submission to him is really submission to God. And if I disagree with his position, and I do not want to cause World War Three in my house, I will say yes, and I will go to his own master. Report him to his master in prayers, and ask the Lord to intervene in the situation. It, so that justice and fairness and what whatever it is that is right and the will of God in that situation can prevail. So for every woman, like I said earlier, work out your own salvation. You work out how to achieve what you need to, still keeping peace in your home, but keeping the word of God and the order of God. But I think submission is meant as a protection for the woman in many ways. But you have to understand it in your own particular situation and work out what it is. And I'm not submitted to my driver because he's a man (laughs) or to my security man or my cook because they are men or to people who work for you because they are men. No, my submission is to my husband. Everything else follows his own order of respect and honor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So I got this message. I was asked to ask this follow-up question. Um, so okay. this woman sent the question to the email and they gave me permission to ask it to that she said that her husband has asked her not to walk. That what should she do? I mean, should she, and she, she wants to walk and she's able to walk. So is that submission for her not to walk? What does she have to do? See, my challenge in a situation like that is always, I don't know what their deal was when they were getting married. <laughs> because sometimes, out of love, women agree to foolish things. Because a woman wants to marry a man, sometimes we will say yes to what we know that we don't like. But you want to get married, so you say yes. And then after you've made that deal, you then want to change the rules mm-hmm. along the way. I don't know that that's the case in this situation. I'm just creating some, uh, uh, narrating some of the scenarios that I've seen before. That's usually problematic. Now, if it's not a case like that, if you were working before your husband met you, which is why I said every girl must have a sense of who she is and where she's going before she chooses the husband. If you were working before your husband met you and he liked you working and married you, how can it be easy for him to now tell you not to work? And if you are working and you start courting and in your conversation during courtship, he's talking about a wife that doesn't work, then you know you shouldn't marry that man. There's just no thing. So because a lot of times we as women as well, we're guilty of these things because we just want to get married. Trust me, one day of all the ceremony is not worth your entire life in an unhappy situation. If you understand the purpose and the call of God for your life, you are responsible for making sure that you make the right decisions to put yourself in a situation where you can fulfill the purpose of God in your life. But having said that, in this situation where we're already we're already married and the husband is already saying that we should not work, I've told you that there's a wisdom for every situation. And every woman knows how to get to her own husband. All right? So he might not want you to work today. But if that is really something that you want, the Bible says the desires of the heart of a righteous man, the Lord will grant. That is a heart desire for you. Make it a prayer point before God. And as you do that, 
keep finding the right ways to communicate your desire to your husband and find some soft landing to get started in work. Find out what his real fears are because sometimes it's about a fear of something. Find out what his real fears are or what his previous experiences are that led him to such a conclusion and try to mitigate his fears and to ameliorate them by making a case for yourself knowing fully well that you are not wherever those people are and you're not about to do what somebody might be. His friend's wife went to work and something happened. Or women that work, men chase them. If you trust your wife and she's not already a wayward person, are going out to work or not working is not what we save her. The rich men that uh, is the gardener that sleeps with their wives in their houses. We watch those movies, don't we? So, yeah, things can still happen depending on who the people are. So it's up to the woman who wants to do this to work out that salvation. Make it a key prayer point. Find out the real fears of your husband and approach him continuously in a way that the Lord will grant you the favor that will lead to the desires of your heart. You know what I always say to men that don't want their women to work? Life happens. Life happens. And I've seen it happen too many times. Husbands die. Mm-hmm. Not because you, you want anybody's husband to die, but it happens. Life happens. Mm. And when it does, and you have a wife that isn't working and children that you have not left millions of dollars behind for her to use to take care of them. Even if you leave money for her to take care of them, if she doesn't have financial management experience, what will happen? She'll lose the money within a short while. Your children will suffer. Men lose their jobs. When you lose your job and you have no support because your wife has never been allowed to work, you will all suffer together. So life happens. It might sound like a good idea or a manly idea, but in the life of today, two incomes combined is still struggling. Let alone talk about one income. And the man might think, I'm doing well, my business will always do well. Well, COVID-19 just happened. A very secured business is now in trouble. And then what? And the wife would like to help, but she has no capacity to. Why? Because the quality of help you get in your day of trouble is the quality of the help her that you raise. So if you raise a wife who has no capacity to help you, your day of trouble, you will get no help. Meanwhile, God did his own part because he gave you a woman who has capacity to work who has desire to work, who could have added value to the situation. And I've watched many women go through this. So the church has, I keep going back to that, the church has a major role in addressing these issues. The church has a major role in addressing these issues. And churches must discuss these issues and help men and women to have better understanding of these factors. We cannot just be stuck in traditional position because it doesn't support the position of the Bible. There's some 31 woman that many women hate and some men might love her because she, her husband is honored at the gate because of her. She's a hardworking woman. She bought land. She bought houses. Mm-hmm. She traded. She's a successful businesswoman. Her husband was honored because of her success. Mm-hmm. I don't see how a man loses if he has a woman who fears the Lord, but who is also allowed to use the gifts of God in her life to create value for her family, for the country, and for the world in every way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ma. I think this is where we will end this session. Thank you so much, Mrs. Ibukun Awashika. We have been blessed so much. Thank you for the words of wisdom. Thank you for inspiring us. And, um, well, I should have done this at the beginning. I didn't even introduce myself. I guess I was too excited to just jump in and start asking the questions. So my name is Tom Faduba from Houston, Texas. And I want to say a big thank you to Pastor Fadel and the leadership of RCCGNA for giving me the opportunity to co-host this session with our dear Pastor Gandhi. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening in. I know that you have been blessed. I know that you have a lot 
um, that you've written down. And I know that you are just going to go out there and get it and become great because that is what God has ordained for each and every one of us. Thank you so much and God bless you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.